morning <laughs> to many of you and uh, also good evening and good afternoon and welcome to this gathering of neuro semantics community from all over the world and i'd like to welcome all of us who got our time wrong <laughs> This is really uh, uh, funny. However, since we are here, let us make the best use of our time. Uh, and uh, I hope that those who will come in later will forgive us for starting uh, before them. Uh, however, we'll have the recording that will help uh, them to follow with, uh, through with this presentation later. For those of you who are not familiar with me, I am Marzuki. I'm a neurosemantics trainer and meta coach from Malaysia. And this is the ISNS Neurosemantics Wisdom Meeting. So let me just share um, screen with you. Here we are. So uh, the purpose of this Neurosemantics Wisdoms Meeting is to have a stronger connection between our international society and also the neurosemantics institutes and members. Uh, it is a platform, uh, one for us to refresh our knowledge of neurosemantics. So that's why we have Michael speaking uh, to us today and also to recharge and be inspired with renewed meetings. I don't know about you. Uh, however, for me, at uh, uh, almost at the end of the day, I do find that when we have these uh, meetings, then I am recharged to the extent that I will have to sleep later uh, because uh, everything's going uh, all uh, excited and I'll take a, probably an hour to wind down in, uh, to do that. So this is about recharging ourselves when we are together. So I wish to honor your presence today by greeting each and every one of you through the National Institutes. So please unmute your mics so that we can honor everyone by loudly greeting in your national language as I introduce the Institute. So are you ready? So let's begin. Yes. The Institute of Neurosemantics Africa. And let's give a big hand to Africa. Dumela! Huyamore! Huyadah! Next is Institute of Neurosemantics Australia. They are already tomorrow in the time zone, however, uh, that's for Australia. Uh, next is the Institute of Neurosemantics Brazil. Yes, uh, welcome, Brazil. And uh, next is the Institute of Neurosemantics Egypt, Middle East, and North Africa. Let's give a big hand to them. And also, next one is the Institute of Neurosemantics Europe and Scandinavia. Let's give them a big hand. And next is the Institute of Neurosemantics Hong Kong and China. Uh, and a uh, big hand to them as well. And next one is the Institute of Neurosemantics Indonesia. Let's give a big hand to them. Uh, and I noticed that they are not here yet. Uh, it's okay, they'll be joining us later. Then we have Institute of Hola. 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 I hear great sound <laughs> from later. <laughs> Wonderful. And next, the Institute of Neurosemantics Malaysia, Philippines, and Singapore. Selamat datang dari Malaysia. And next is the Institute of Neurosemantics, the US of A. Let's give them a big hand for that. Wonderful <laughs> to see all of you uh, today. It is an honor and pleasure for me to be meeting uh, you again. And I... The meeting today is, as usual, it is scheduled for about uh, uh, 60 to 80 minutes. We have the presentation. Michael will be making presentation on Thinking for Human Part 3. Uh, that is scheduled for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we'll have two discussion sessions. And I'll be giving you the uh, questions for discussions. We have about 12 minutes each for discussion. Uh, and then we will come into the main room for sharing and then we will go for the second discussion and uh, and that will be what we are going to have for uh, today. So without further ado, we are all here and ready uh, to uh, continue with the uh, 
presentation, I would like to uh, introduce to you Dr. Michael Hall to present Thinking for Humans Part 3. How to think clearly, precisely, accurately, and practically. So over to you, Michael. Okay, thank you, Marzuki. We started this series um, two, two months ago. And the reason is because um, uh, one of the one of the things I've really discovered here recently is that it's NLP, instead of being a communication model, is actually a thinking model. Because when you think about what NLP introduced, and and that is the representational systems, the visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Uh, systems, the linguistic systems, these are channels of how we think. These are ways that we think. And so when it comes to communication, actually, that's a pretty general, vague term for thinking. So how do we think? Well, I, I see pictures in my mind, I visualize, I, I hear sounds, I I can use words. I can I can sense it in my body. I can feel how to drive a car or ride a bike or type on a on a keyboard. So thinking in NLP, what really opened up NLP was these four thinking channels. Inside of the kinesthetics channel, of course, we include smelling and, and tasting and really just all of the other senses sense of balance, um, the vestibular system uh, for sensing where we are in space. So uh, as I got thinking about that, I started making a list of all words that indicate some form of thinking. And if you have attended the Brain Camp number one, or if you've seen the book, Executive Thinking, You've seen that chart that has more than 100 words for thinking. So that got me thinking about thinking, that uh, thinking is what the mind does. So I wrote an article a few weeks ago for Neuron's uh, mind as a verb. In, in fact, in English, I don't know in the other languages, in English, we oftentimes use the word mind, your mind, um, as a verb, uh, mind the gap, mind your mother, uh, mind me. And what we're doing is asking a person to think about what um, your mother says or think about the gap uh, in the uh, subway. So, so what the mind does is think. And when we put together the meta place, the meta place is actually built around the 14 E classifications of thinking. So that it's a it's a model of the landscape, the mind. So now we can have have these landscape, these landmarks of consciousness, so that when I listen to someone talk, if I hear them talking about visual or auditory or kinesthetic, I know that they're making a movie in their mind. If I hear them using um, abstract words, I know they're in the linguistic system. If I hear them talking about things that they know are for sure, they have moved up into the meta thinking level of believing. And that believing may take all kinds of forms, valuing, imagining, remembering, uh, predicting, uh, intending. So when it comes to thinking, um, we humans have lots and lots of words for thinking. And and yet, one of the things that we all know is that mo most of us have a really struggle with thinking well. So when it comes to thinking clearly and precisely and accurately, which is what the meta model the linguistic model of NLP was designed to teach how to think clearly. Most of us really struggle at it. And the reason people come to coaching, to come to therapy, come to trainings, 
is to learn to think better, to think strategically about how do I reach this or that goal? So when it comes to, to thinking, clear thinking, precise thinking, accurate thinking, we call that critical thinking. Um, critical thinking is the ability to use our mind or consciousness to create a map that's going to enable us to be effective in our everyday life. So NLP started with the difference between the map, what we're thinking and presenting and encoding in some way, and, and the map, the, the territory, the, the world out there. And we all function by thinking. The quality of your functioning, the quality of your life, is a is the quality of your thinking. So NLP and now neurosemantics is all about thinking. If we think about neurosemantics, semantics, meaning, how do we create meaning? Well, 25 years ago, when I started with the meta-states model, I distinguished, I think, 10 ways that we make meaning. And you can think of these 10 ways that we make meaning as 10 ways that we think. So when I encounter anything, I want to know, and I ask the question, what is that? So that's identity. I try to identify what it is. Once I identify it, well, that's its meaning. It it is this identity. I want to know how it functions. How does it work? How does it function? So that's cause effect thinking. If I do this with it, it'll have this effect. Consequential thinking. Then I want to know what's its value. So, so I start thinking of its significance, its value, its importance. So here's another way of thinking, way of me making meaning. So when we look at neural semantics, just like NLP, if we say NLP is a communication model, or neural semantics is a meaning-making model, in both instances, we're actually talking about thinking. So that's why this series on thinking for humans, and uh, let's go to the next slide. So this is the most essential thing that we all do. Um, think. And we, while we all think, we do not all think equally well. I've been watching the news, as you have, of all these protesters. Yesterday, I wrote an article about the problem with the protesters all around the world. They're not thinking very clearly. I mean, they're really not. They're reacting. What we see is reaction, not thinking. And so that's one of the things um, 2018 that I put in the book, Executive Thinking, that seven non-thinking ways of using your brain. So yeah, their brain is being used, their mind is operating, but it's operating really in a non-human way, just reacting. So reacting or automatic thinking or borrowed thinking, that is, I'm not saying what I think, I'm saying what I've heard and I'm just repeating. So it's politically correct, we see, but it's, it's borrowed thinking uh, or agenda thinking. And another form of non-thinking is, is knowing or being sure. Because when you know something and you're sure, you've closed your mind. You're not actually thinking. So the next slide I begins to identify what thinking is. It's It seems so obvious, so easy, so inevitable. And yet, when we look at it from the standpoint of the skills of thinking, it's one of the most difficult things to do. The next slide, what is thinking? What does it mean when, you, when we say that um, someone is thinking? Or when we say, wait a minute, let me think about that. What are we actually doing? Now, if this is what the mind does, it thinks, and we have these 100 words or more for how we think, then the question is, what actually is thinking? And that takes us to the next slide. 
John Dewey, in his book, How We Think, which was written like 1910, he said, thinking is working an idea over in your mind. So you're working an idea. So there's some idea. So what you, we could ask, what's your idea? What are you thinking about? This thinking, this process that utilizes all the functions of the brain, it, it is taking an idea and working it, questioning it, doubting it, sustaining it, giving evidence for it, uh, uh, encoding it in some way. So when you think you, you've got some idea going on and you're working it. So that's the that's that part of thinking that is effortful. So if you've ever done some thinking, you heard something new and you you really were working at it, you might have become mentally tired afterwards because there was a lot of effort. You might have even said, you know, my brain is hurting. Let me let me take a rest for a minute because I've been thinking considering, questioning, understanding, learning, uh, deciding with regard to this idea. So this is thinking. Thinking is working an idea over in your mind. And John Dewey said that the origin of thinking is some perplexity, confusion, or doubt. I, I find that just wonderful and fascinating. If you don't have some perplexity, some problem you're solving, some confusion, some questioning, some doubting, you're probably not thinking. So that's why we say, if if you don't have a question going on, then your mind is probably not working an idea over and trying to come to some understanding, learning, clarity about it. So this is our definition of thinking. And the next slide is about NLP. And what we, what I started with, that actually NLP is a thinking model. And I've written a couple articles about that, that NLP is a thinking model. And, and while we have sold it as a communication model, and it certainly is, because with our thinking, we communicate. But if you're not doing good thinking, you may be an excellent communicator. You can get that, those meanings, those ideas over to someone else and present them. But if you're, if it's not based on good thinking, then we got a problem. So here's a list of some of the, the most essential aspects of thinking, representing something in our mind, associating one thing with another. That creates a lot of that cause-effect thinking, causational. We humans are always trying to connect things, find a pattern, find a, um, a, a law or a rule of how something is working. There's the linguistic thinking. And with linguistic thinking, we all think in our own languages. And if you know more than one language, you can you have two symbolic systems you can use. If you can speak in three languages, you got three symbolic systems. And uh, some of these linguistic systems, languages, allow you to think certain things, and everyone has its limitations. You can't think certain ideas in certain languages. Isn't that amazing? So that's where that's where it's 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 good for us to share uh, the idea that is encoded in our language and see if we have some way of translating it to another language. There's evaluative thinking. That's when we make judgments, evaluations, and it's what the brain does. It jumps to conclusions, and those conclusions end up being our beliefs, what we think is important, our values, and when you repeat them long enough, it becomes a thinking pattern or a metaprogram. Integrative thinking is something else that we all do. It's, it's what the body does so that the, the, the brain is sending these signals and messages to the rest of the body of how to, how to 
actualize the idea or the thought. And we call that embodiment. We experience it as a state. So whatever state you're in, you've thought yourself into that state. You've represented something, connected something, used certain words, made certain evaluations, and now you're in that state. So here, here is something about NLP. When you learn NLP, actually, you're learning to hopefully do better, more precise, more accurate thinking so that the maps that you make will be maps that will take you where you want to go. So um, that led me to identify 14 thinking powers, 14 thinking skills, and I put them into three categories. I put them in the category, first of all, of, of um, uh, essential skills, five essential skill thinking skills by which we uh, can determine if an idea is legitimate, if it's realistic, if it's based on any kind of facts or evidence, essential thinking skills. Then for Eureka thinking skills, and these skills, um, whereas the essential take us down and enable us to ground our thoughts so that they're grounded in reality. The Eureka helps us to build new ideas, ideas that may not exist in anybody else's mind. And so we have four of those that enable us to be very creative and to not be stuck in just the essential skills, but we can invent new ways of thinking, new ideas, new comprehensions, new learnings. And then the executive skills, which we'll get to today, and these are based upon the prefrontal cortex in your brain, which um, animals do not have, and which enable us to do what animals cannot do. We can set intentions, plan for the future, have a concept of time, concept of self, uh, concept of uh, relationships to other people, to systems. And so with the executive skills, uh, it takes us really into what Abraham Maslow would call the being realm, uh, being cognition. So let me summarize um, the, the first nine thinking skills or thinking powers. And the next slide is our first one, considering. So if you can't consider something, then you can't even start the whole thinking process. Considering is the very beginning. You're trying on an idea. You're giving it a chance. And you're giving a chance by representing it. And so you listen to someone, and whatever they say, you try it on from the assumption of, what if that is true? What if that is real? Uh, what would What would it be like in my mind to consider it? And as I say these words, you can realize uh, how that when people argue, this is what doesn't happen. Both parties do not really take time to consider the others. I mean, if you, we are too reactive, we're, we have too much agendas in our own mind. We, we know what we already know. So we don't even take the time to be open to new ideas. So if this is the beginning of thinking, then when you listen to people in meetings, when you listen to people uh, debating, when you listen to different sides of an issue on the news, what we find is that the communication is really poor because people are not doing the, the first thinking skill, which is trying it on, considering it. Now, to consider it, you've got to be open to ambiguities and uncertainties. And who wants to be uncertain? Who wants to have ambiguity? We want to know. We want to, we want to be definite. And, and if you don't allow that, if you don't permit that, then thinking cannot even get started. That's the first thinking power uh, to consider. And this power 
is a power of taking on some ideas and working them over in your mind. If what you say is true, then I would have this picture, I would say these words, I would have this sensation. And so we give it a chance. The next one is questioning. So once I try something on, um, instead of just buying it wholesale and just complying and going along and just letting them, letting whatever I'm considering um, be considered the last word, start questioning. So if you're not questioning, that's why we say you're really probably not thinking. Questioning is when you explore more about that idea that you're considering, when you search it out, when you have curiosity and wonderment, and when you allow yourself to not know. If you're a coach, a consultant, a therapist, or a parent, then when, when you hear something, and it doesn't immediately make sense. You you have the chance to think, that is to consider, and now start questioning. And isn't this what we do in coaching and and counseling and consulting? Someone presents something, we use our not knowing to help them and us in this collaborative thinking to understand it more thoroughly. And by questioning it, we we now uh, see how solid it is or not solid, how realistic or unrealistic it is. And so the power of questioning. If you're not questioning, you're not thinking. So those of you who are trainers, um, if you're a parent, asking someone, so what question do you have in your mind? is actually a way to stimulate and evoke people to start using their brain, using their mind to think. Well, thinking now leads us to the next skill, doubting. And doubting is when I am questioning the source. Where, where, where did that come from? Who said that? In what book? Written at what time? In what year? In what culture? In what context? And so now I'm questioning the source of information, the validity of information, the credibility of information. And so this is skepticism. It, it's not cynicism. Cynicism is a belief that something is worthless. Skepticism is being skeptical about its quality. And if the quality of our thinking is the quality of our lives, our communication, or well-being, relationship, then skepticism is the is the way that we test things. So skepticism is at the heart of the scientific attitude of here's my idea, my hypothesis. I'm going to test it, see if it works, see if it pans out. So skepticism um, has been beaten out of a lot of people. They were not allowed to question. Don't you dare question me in the sense of, I doubt that that is really good information. And so we need to recover our skepticism and to wonder about things not said, what's missing, what's not known. Because whatever you know, there's a whole lot more that you don't know about what you don't know, which is one of the um, double binds of knowledge and understanding, the more you know, the more you can become aware of there's all kinds of things that I don't know about. So doubting becomes a, a way that we work an idea over in our mind. The next one is detailing. Detailing is getting specific. It is getting precise. And this is what the meta model is all about, uh, getting specific instead of living in the world of words. And that's where most of us and most societies today, if you read the newspaper, if you read, if you listen to the news, most of the things that are being communicated are communicated in unspecified 
nouns and verbs, nominalizations, metaphors, um, abstract language instead of specific language. And so when you detail it, when you say specifically, when did it happen? Where did it happen? With whom did that happen? If I could see it, what would I see? If I could hear the sounds that it's making, what would I hear? If I could identify the sensations in the body. So this is what we mean by sensory specific, grounding words into see here feel world. And when we do this, then we are getting rid of the vagueness. And now we can create real specific movies for our mind. Uh, Alfred Korzybski called this extensionalizing. So I, I have these words and I'm going to extend out my definition into the world to see examples of and samples of that word. So this is detailing. Um, it's what we do with our clients in coaching. Those people, when they live in a vague world um, that's, that, that really is as the structure of hypnosis, they're in a trance. And they're saying trance-like things like, like, I'll never amount to anything. Then they're just hypnotizing themselves into some real dysfunction. And by, by asking the clarity questions, we, we get the details. When you get details, then you can do something else. And that's the next one. And that is distinguishing. So here's something else your, your brain, your mind is designed to do. And that is to make distinctions. And genius is in distinctions. So when you get to the details and you can start separating things so, so that you don't fuse them, unfuse them together, now you're able to sort out different things and see how that they function in a different way and that they're not the same. Uh, Alfred Korzybski was constantly writing in his, his original book, Science and Sanity, there is no sameness. So everything's always changing. It's in the process of changing. Um, and so once we start realizing that, we can sort things out. Basic confusions that people have, they confuse what they do with who they are. And now their self-esteem, talk about a, a, an abstract concept, their self-esteem is conditional, conditioned on what they do, what they have, uh, what they have achieved, their status. And it's all based on this confusion. People are not distinguishing being a person from doing or having um, uh, as a person, as an expression of yourself. So distinguishing is what leads to um, uh, science and 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 the understanding of the differences. And this is what Gregory Bateson was constantly saying that what really gets onto the map is is difference, the difference that makes a difference. That's what we do in distinguishing. So those five are the essential thinking skills. If you can't do those, it's going to be really hard for you to be realistic, precise, appropriate, practical. These are the uh, critical thinking skills. You have the power to do these five things, to consider, to question, to doubt, to detail, and to distinguish. And when you do, you can become a very clear thinker and if you can think clearly, communicate that to yourself, then you can communicate that with others. And this is at the very essence of the meta model. The next four skills are generative skills. They generate new ideas. And instead of going down to, to sort things out and ground them, we're, we're just going to generate some new things. And the first one is inference. So when you make an inference, you're thinking logically or rationally that whatever has been said is logically connected to something else. Something else is implied. And now 
what is not said or presented, you can find. Well, there's there's simple inferences that we can make. He's my second son, implies lots of things. I'm a father. Um, I have a I have a first son. Um, it implies a lot of things that's not said. So to to use your thinking to discover hidden premises, hidden assumptions, hidden beliefs, which are implied in whatever somebody says, you'll you'll need to use your inferential thinking, inferential listening. And sometimes sometimes what is implied may not be logically, rationally implied. So you make a guess, an educated guess. Of course, this is what we do in science whenever we have a hypothesis. So we're identifying maybe the, the class that something belongs to. So if somebody says, I'll never amount to anything, that belongs into the class of concepts about self, concepts about the future, concepts about achievement. All that's implied in that one little sentence. I'll never amount to anything. I is in the in the classification of self or personhood. Never is an absolute statement. Uh, amount, never amount is about achievement, or accomplishment, or direction, or, or or growth. So it's in those contexts. Uh, anything, and so it's about the, it implies the future and predictive thinking. So when you can do inference. You can pick up on a lot that's there, but it's not expressed. And so you can start to make educated guesses and hypotheses about what's going on. This is an essential cultural skill, essential therapy skill, an essential leadership skill to be able to do uh, inference for what people are implying but have not said. And oftentimes, they imply it, and they don't even know what they have implied, uh, their assumptions, their premises. Well, the next one is ordering. So ordering or organizing knowledge is, um, is a thinking skill that enables us to now put different pieces together in a new and a different way. And when you start constructing and putting these things, associating them, you're creating what we call knowledge. So now I, I have knowledge about how to build a bicycle or knowledge about how to do leadership in an organization. So I've taken all these details, these distinctions, um, these considerations, and I'm putting them together and creating a strategy, a process, for how something is going to work. So now with organizing in my mind, I can organize how I'm going to live out my day or how I'm going to accomplish a certain task. And this sequencing of data is what we call by this power, organizing. Animals who can organize like a beaver with a dam or birds flying to a certain place, uh, seasons of the year, they have an organization, but they're not conscious of it. And this is the, the difference. We can consciously construct a strategy. And when we do so, then we have a structure for that experience. So take, take the abstraction, uh, depression. Um, there's a structure to depression. It doesn't just happen. You have to set some things up organize them in a certain way so that you can get into that state or embodiment. And because, because everything has a structure and is organized in some way, then we have the ability now to model. And this is where NLP went into modeling the structure, the subjective experience. And we've continued that in neurosemantic as we've been modeling many, many things that are not tangible but intangible, like leadership, like listening, like uh, framing, uh, we can do that by organizing our thoughts. 
some people's thoughts are really disorganized. You listen to them talk, and there, it's like there's no order. It's it, it's tangential thinking. It goes here, it goes there, it jumps here, and there's not order to it. And to live with a mind that cannot order things is to li really live in a fairly schizophrenic world. So organizing is such an important one. It gives us a peace of mind and a serenity when you can say, I know how to do that. I know how this or that works. The next one is creating. And th this is an obvious one, that our brain is always putting things together and creating things that didn't exist uh, a moment ago. So we take these pieces, these distinctions, these considerations, and we put them together playfully, combining in an imaginative way. And now with our imaginative thinking skills, we can invent all kinds of new things. This is the source of all civilization, science, as we create and invent what didn't exist before. So um, we got lots of tools by which we can do this, metaphors, categories, um, and, and now jumping outside of a frame that we've set to, to setting new frames that invites new things. So creative thinking. We're all creative. Uh, we have limited creativity too much to the arts, to writing or, or uh, drawing or sculpturing or music. But creativity involves everything we do. And everybody is creative. Some people have developed it in a specific area to a much greater extent. Some people have not. Creativity is what allows us to not get stuck in some way of thinking that is blocking us from unleashing our own potentials. The next one and the last one here in these Eureka skills or these, these instructive skills is synergizing. So this is the next step after creating that you, you put some things together and suddenly there's an emergence. Something emerges that's more than and greater than the sum of the parts. Emergence or synergy. And so emergence or synergy uh, occurs um, sometimes accidentally. Lots of inventions have been accidental and it arises from this ability to um, for things to come together and then to generate something more than the sum of the parts. In in uh, meta states, we have gestalt states like like courage, like self esteem. These are states that you put all the parts together, and these are emergent qualities that emerges out of it, and so. Thinking in a synergistic way is working with the system. And there's lots of systems. There's the mind-body system. And you as a system, uh, living inside of other systems, your family system, your cultural system, your business system, your ethnic system, your uh, national system. And so when there are systems and when systems merge together, you can almost always count on synergy. And this synergy, this thing that emerges that's more than the sum of the parts, uh, can can either be very healthy or it can be pretty destructive. So that's where we need to sometimes go back and pull it apart with the essential skills to detail and distinguish things that we need to do. Well, that brings us to executive thinking. And the next slide. So the executive thinking skills, um, these skills are based upon what occurs in your prefrontal cortexes. Um, and uh, these skills depend on and contain all of the previous nine skills. So they emerge really as a synergy from the earlier nine skills. So uh, the next slide. 
So from the prefrontal cortex, we're going to have five more um, skills or powers. And, and so I've put them into these categories, learning, deciding, discerning, reflecting, and sacralizing. And so what is executive thinking? The next slide. It is thinking as an executive, as you manage, govern, and direct all your previous thinking skills. So the, these are called executive functions uh, in, in brain um, literature and uh, the brain anatomy. It's called, they're called executive functions. And that's because like an executive over a company, these are the, these are the thinking powers or skills by which you, you really run your company, the company of you. Um, you become the executive to make executive decisions about learning, about, about commitments and intentions, about discernments and wisdom, about uh, reflecting and meta-reflecting, metacognition, and about sacralizing. So... Um, each of these skills, these five that we go through, we, they occur in simple forms in the earlier nine, but now they rise up to a whole new level at the executive level. So the first executive one is learning. So the next slide. So uh, before we get to learning by itself, you can see these these five powers. Um, so learning is comprehending and concluding. Deciding goes to intending and purposing. Discerning goes to wisdom and action. Reflexivity goes to metacognition and self-reflexivity. And then sacralizing goes to being cognition. And that means non-instrumental thinking. So we'll get to each of these here in a moment. So the next slide is lear learning. So every skill of the first nine, you learn something. When you consider, you're learning. When you're questioning, you're learning. When you're doubting, when you're distinguishing, when you're detailing, when you're inferring. So learning has, has occurred in all of the previous ones. Um, but what now occurs at, at this level is meta-learning. Because now you're taking charge of your learning. So now you're choosing what to learn how to learn, and and so it's moving up to a much higher level. One of the things here in this level is you're learning about things uh, that are abstract and conceptual. You're learning about yourself. So you're going to make all kinds of understandings, conclusions about who you are, what you are, where you're going, um, your identity, your self-image, your self-efficacy, your self-esteem. You're going to do the same thing with your uh, intentionality. You're going to be learning that uh, attention is is at the lowest level, and you can set intentions that control the attentions. You're going to be learning um, about meaning and how to make meaning and construct meaning. And when you do, you learn you're a meaning maker, and it's in your control your power. You'll be learning about your powers, the choices you have, and that and the freedom that you have, the free will to make choices. And so you'll be learning there. You'll be learning about others and relationships and that your your brain is a social brain. Uh, it's got it's got the mirror neurons by which you're always connecting to other people and, and the role of other people. And then time, and learning about time and that you're a temporal being and you live in time. So the learning here takes you to a whole new level. And, and so um, uh, this meta learning, now, now you're in charge of your learning. And usually when you get to this place and you develop this power, learning becomes such a thrill it becomes joyful learning. Before, 
yeah, you learn. And it was, but it was effortful and it may have been hard and you may not have liked it. But when you learn how to learn, that's what this one's about. When you learn how you can learn in new and different ways, how you can update your learning, learning now becomes your instinct for being human. So people who get out of school and they're burned out and they don't ever want to read another book, they don't ever want to talk about anything intellectual, they have they have dismissed um, and rejected this thinking power of learning. The next one is deciding. Oh, here, here we got uh, ways of learning. Um, so if you look up the word learning uh, in the dictionary, it comes from an original statement of, of uh, tracking. And the question becomes, what are we tracking? Because uh, it's a metaphor. Learn, to learn is to track. Well, to track with someone. That is to follow their line of thinking. So that's what learning is. So if you read a book or listen to someone, you're you're following their line of thinking, their the way they're reasoning and coming up, coming to a conclusion. And now now that you have something you can take away from it. Uh, the word understanding literally refers to standing under something. And when you stand under those concepts, stand under those frames, then those frames govern how you put things together and understand something. So um, these are just some of the um, sub-skills under meta-learning. Let's go to the next one, deciding. So this goes to uh, a wonderful aspect in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, we call it your intentionality. This is the capacity to set intentions. So it's not intentions. We, we have intentions from the very beginning when we consider something. I intend to consider it, to write on. I intend to question it. I intend to doubt. But intentionality is, is a higher level executive function in which you are using your capacity to set an intention for yourself, for others, for the future. So it's planning. It's predictive thinking. This is what animals really cannot do. They have instincts. And so uh, they're already programmed for how to how to predict what's going to happen, how to predict where to get food, where to get shelter, how to mate. But we have full control over this, if you develop it, to set intentions. And this is this is exactly what we do in the when we do coaching. What do you want? Is accessing this part of the brain to make a decision, to make a commitment of yourself and your intention the pathway that you want to create. This is what gives us a sense of purpose, a sense of living on purpose and not just being thrown around by every everything that comes your way. And it's you choosing that orientation and, and now very intentionally and instrumentally planning your life. So this is deciding. And the next slide has uh, sub skills for deciding. Um, to decide, you're going to be identifying, considering options. So, what are the options? Um, how many how many options do I have in terms of what's on the table to choose between? Taking your desires, that's the emotional state that builds up for intentions, um, and turning them into wants and then intentions and and so with intentionality we can anticipate consequences we can live in the future before the future happens and then come back from that future and and make decisions and intentions that's going to help us to plan a pathway forward as we do that we can do risk management 
have plan B and plan C if plan A doesn't work out exactly the way that we're anticipating. So here's a, another executive function in your mind as you executively decide, here's what I'm going to focus on. Here's, here's the questions I'm going to use in my life. Here's the considerations. Here's the relationships. And so now, very intentionally, you are aligning all your attentions to your intention. And when you do that, you can focus. You can concentrate. Someone who doesn't hasn't developed their intentionality will struggle with, with concentrating and focusing. Attentions will come up and they get distracted. Uh, they can't screen them out. But an intentional person, and this is what we do in the genius uh, state, is we set the intention. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's when and where and how. And, and now we commission the executive part of our mind, the part of our mind that makes up our mind, so that now we're committed in a purposeful way and we're living purposefully. So lots of people come to coaching and, and counseling for this very reason. They don't feel that their life is under their control. And so to get it under their control, we get them into that executive decision process. So this is deciding the bigger things of life, not the smaller ones. The next one is discerning. So discerning um, grows out of the learning and the deciding, and the discerning is now uh, discerning, just like when we did distinctions, it's, it's discerning different things in different contexts. And so everything is in multiple contexts at any given moment. And so discerning, there's this context and this context, my work, my life, my family, my health, my business, a lot of contexts. Discernment is the ability to make wise decisions that is, is going to um, allow the context to be integrated in, instead of an either-or kind of a way of thinking that, that pays a price um, I'm going to be a workaholic, and the price I pay is I can't really have a good family life or health or wellness or fitness because I'm so overdoing one thing. The person is not discerning the integration of multiple systems. Now, with, with the context, there's going to be even a hierarchy of context. So like in values, we value survival, we value safety, we value friends and associates, we value feeling feeling that we count and we're important. And, and then there's all the self-actualization values. So there's a hierarchy of values. It's the hierarchy of values that you're discerning. And so um, now recognizing and embracing the whole and having that priority of context at any given moment, being able to access that criteria, and then to um, um, humbly own, you, this is my perspective, and and discerning that it's fallible, could be wrong, um, may need to correct it a little bit later. And this leads to what we call wisdom. So the next slide, to discern, Identify the key distinctions that you're working with, embracing and holding these multiple perspectives, uh, identifying context and context of contexts. This is why we ask the ecology question in NLP and neural semantics. So does this, is this ecological for you? Does this fit? Does it bring out your best? Does it empower you? Does it enhance your life? Or will it mess anything up? So, the ecology question is the question that helps us to be wise in our decisions so that uh, we, we uh, make smarter decisions and have less regret. 
So discernment. The next one um, is reflexivity. So uh, your brain and mine is reflexive in the sense that whatever I think, I can think about that thinking. And then I can step back to think about the thinking I did of the original thinking. And so we're reflexive by our very nature. And this is what gives us freedom of thought so that I can always step back from my thinking, my feeling, my state. I can always step back and have new thoughts, feelings, and states. And this is what creates metastates. It what creates that layering of, of, of thoughts in our consciousness. So we never just think. We think about our thinking. We feel about our feeling. And so now we can climb that ladder of the layers of consciousness. An interesting thing about reflexivity is that the first things you do tend to become the frames that you then do your next thinking inside of that frame. And sometimes that original thinking it w was developed by a six-year-old brain or a 13-year-old brain. And that original thinking is our highest and most unconscious frame of reference. And it, it may be undermining us and being very dysfunctional for us. And so as we climb the layers to see what's behind there, what's back there in the back of the mind, we, we are detecting and then monitoring those levels so that we can make some good ecological choices that this works for me or it doesn't. And, and now we can either step out of the whole matrix of frames or we can outframe it. These are just old thoughts. They're irrelevant. They're redundant. I don't need them anymore. And we can, in that way, do some unlearning. So reflexivity is the control center. With reflexivity, reflexive thinking, um, now you can take control of all of the powers of the mind, all of the essential skills, all of the eureka skills, and all of these executive skills. It really enables you to be the executive to yourself. The next slide has some of the sub-skills. So this is what we mean by go meta, step out, and step back so that you can observe the, the mental emotional functioning th that you're doing. So this is reflecting. When you're reflecting, you're detecti detecting the levels and categories, you're monitoring, um, you're finding the structure. So a lot of people keep themselves so busy and so involved in entertainment um, or just busy things, social things that they don't take time to reflect. Once again, this is at the heart of coaching. We ask people to come in and we're going to ask you questions. We're going to invite you to reflect on your life, reflect on your thinking, reflect on your values, reflect on your purpose. And so reflecting then becomes one of the most powerful thinking uh, skills that that you and I can develop. Uh, and the last one is sacralizing. So this takes us to what Abraham Maslow called being cognition. And that's different from efficiency cognition. If you remember, the lower part of the hierarchy is about deficiency needs, and the higher are about being needs or abundant needs. And so being cognition is the, the very cognition of self-actualization. So it's, it's about being who you are as a person, not what you're doing, not what you're having, not your status, not your achievements. It's being authentically yourself, being real. So all of the other thinking, all the first 13 aspects of thinking has been instrumental. It is like, I, I think this way so that I can achieve this, I can accomplish that, I can go there. It's all instrumental, which is so essential if we're going to organize our lives and live, live our lives effectively. 
now we move to something that is non-instrumental. There's no purpose to it except to be. So Abraham Maslow illustrated this with the musician who plays music, who loves to play the music, and who, and when he asks, what's the purpose of this? The, the, the musician says, just because. And so a musician must play, a poet must write, what a person is, that person must be. And that's what he defined as the ultimate of self-actualization, learning to be our real selves, our inmost self, our highly developed self. So sacralizing, it's seeing this preciousness. Sacralizing, it's seeing how sacred, how important, how valuable you and each person is. And so when you sacralize, you're not just giving instrumental meanings to things. This is what this is. This is how it works. This is what I, this is the value of it. But non-instrumental value, this is valuable in and of itself. Um, and, and so um, this is being cognition. And sacralizing means that once you can really do this, then everything in life becomes sacred. Everything becomes precious. So once you achieve this level, all of life is an adventure, a discovery, and a, a wonderful experience. So our slides for the sub-skills, uh, shifting out of instrumental thinking, embracing being for itself, and most of us in capitalistic societies, this is really, really difficult to, to stop thinking of results and to start thinking of just being and the process of being uh, ourselves, uh, sacralizing uh, high-value meanings, um, once again, quality controlling and embracing our authenticity. So that um, gives us the... Um, the, the summary of our cognitive power. So the next slide, uh, just once again, here's here's the diagram I found on the internet about the prefrontal cortex and all of the things that comes out of this from empathy, insight, flexibility, uh, being able to manage and control ourselves, morality, intuition. So what we're talking about today with these executive skills is just really a tiny little bit of what, what is available for us in these executive powers. The next slide. So in developing your metacognitive powers, then the key will become will be becoming aware of your thinking, monitoring it, then regulating it, and then choosing it. And then this is going to open up a whole range of choices for us. So next slide, questions. Turn it open, turn it loose. Yes, uh, thank you, Michael, for that presentation. So we covered on uh michael gave a summary of uh thinking skill part one part two so then we had the uh, additional uh thinking skill so any questions uh that anybody has for the time being it's a lot i know <laughs> it requires a lot of thinking Exactly. <laughs> well, if you don't have questions for me, uh, we have questions for you. Yes. I have a question. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking that this about sacralizing because I, I'm, I'm uh, quite, um, I'm, I'm meditating a lot. 
um, and this sacralizing, uh, this that level of being, uh, sort of connects very much to sort of a deeper state of meditation where where the thinking process is sort of um, sort of uh, slowed down, and you you train your ability to just be with the presence. Uh, so, can you say a little bit more about that and how you sort of develop this uh, uh, sort of uh, skills or uh, what you presented and the connection between meditation? Yeah. So meditation falls under number 13, reflexivity. Because when you're reflecting, you're meditating, you're thinking about yourself or some aspect of life. And so meditation is an aspect of reflexivity. So it's certainly one of the most powerful skills that we have in terms of thinking. Um, yeah, thank you. So how, I, I just wonder, because uh, I, I see a lot of similarities between uh, sort of meditation, meditation and contempl contemplative practices and meta, uh, meta sort of coaching and meta stating. Uh, how how do you think uh, meditation practices and contemplation practices can sort of be be connected or be helpful, skillful means in in our, in our coaching? So, um, for me, re meditation or reflection is one tool that we use. So, coaching itself is a reflection. Is we're asking a person to reflect on how you're going what you're doing, what you're wanting, what's blocking you, what's getting in the way, what do you want to unleash? Then we go to the other thinking skills, deciding, uh, learning, um, putting it into action, um, detailing something, uh, inferring something. So reflection becomes one tool that we use. If a person stays in reflection, then they're not going to do anything. They're just reflecting. And so it's dangerous. Every one of these thinking powers is dangerous if misused. And the misuse of mindfulness or meditation or just reflecting is that you end up just reflecting and mm -hmm. you're not getting back into life uh, doing something. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, if I may ask uh, a question, uh, you mentioned that uh, the words that you used was, you can't think certain ideas in certain languages. So what struck me was, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about languages, however, people speaking even the same language, if their language ability is different, um, uh, for example, yeah. uh, somebody whose uh, language vocabulary is at the 15 year old as compared to somebody whose language vocabulary as, is at 25 year old, then it means that uh, I can't explain certain ideas if that person doesn't have that uh, language uh, vocabulary because uh, the, the language uh, uh, inhibits the thinking ability, they cannot rise to that level. Okay. Yeah. yeah, can you just comment on that? <laughs> well, you're exactly right that your consciousness, your thinking skills is based on your vocabulary skills. So the more limited your vocabulary, the more limited your thinking. And this is why it's really good to learn some other languages. But the languages, the symbol, symbolic systems, can also be like mathematics, like statistics, like artwork, like mind mapping, the diagramming. These gives us another symbolic system by which we can think and contemplate something. And it's one of the... It's one of the real values of training, and I encourage all trainers, don't hold back from the jargon. Teach the jargon. Because a person will have 
expand their vocabulary. And as they expand their vocabulary, they'll have new words for describing things they can't describe in a limited vocabulary. I see we have a couple questions up on the list. And where did they go? Uh, uh, this one from uh, Leonardo. Uh, question one, do all the NLP and neurosemantic tools that you teach us lead to reflexivity? And second question is, what neurosemantic tool lead us to sacredness? Are they meta questions? Is it the question of why? Um, yeah. So that's the question. So let me ask answer the first, second one first. That's a little easier. Um, to, to the tools to move to anything that we call sacred would be anything that helps us to elicit values, prioritize values. So in meta coaching, we ask why is that important to you, and whatever their answer is, we take that. And we say, oh, so achievement is important. Why is that important to you? And we move up and create a value hierarchy. And a value hierarchy is going to help a person to, to live their lives in a more spiritual way. And I'm using spiritual in the sense of in spirit. It puts spirit in me. It puts heart into me. I'm, I'm heartened. Um, instead of dispirited, um, I'm inspired. And, and so anything that taps into intentionality, what's your highest intention is asking for that purposefulness. And this helps to develop that sense of sacredness. So yes, these are meta questions. Um, and, and so it leads us into building up those, uh, that kind of framework for ourselves that we're, we're living for things that really matter, that really count. And so um, and another question that helps us to move there is the ecology questions. Um, what would be the most ecological belief, ecological value, ecological decision, ecological identity that you could develop? And that will lead in the same direction. About the question, do all NLP neurosemantic tools lead us to reflexivity? Not all of them. Um, not all of them. We have two directions. One direction is, is to ask the meta questions and to move upward. And then we have tools for moving downward. So every mind to muscle uh, pattern tool that we have in neurosemantics is a moving down to implement and move to execution. So mind to muscle, let's take this great idea, this principle, let's turn it into belief, a decision, a feeling, an action. So that's not moving toward reflexivity. It's using reflexivity to now create life orientation. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's move to the next uh, section, which is the section for the group discussion. Now, before I move to the next section, uh, I'd just like to clear some uh, queries that you may have in your mind. Uh, for those of you who joined in the last 24 minutes, you are wondering what happened to the schedule because uh, Michael has been uh, started speaking already and we are supposed to start at on that hour. It's just that there was a big group of people who joined in one hour early. That includes Michael and me. Uh, I, I had to open the door. Uh, however, uh, <laughs> a big group of people, uh, we had the wrong time and we were here one hour early and it was decided that let's start uh, off uh, and then allow the rest of you to join in. So uh, you, the, those of you who joined in the last 25 minutes, you were not wrong with the time, you were right. <laughs> it's just that we started uh, much earlier. However, I've got the whole thing recorded and uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can view the video 
later. Okay, so let's move on to the discussion. Let me just uh, first send the file to you. Uh, if you have noticed earlier, I've uh, sent the, uh, the slides for the whole presentation that Michael uh, gave just now. So I've sent that already. Now I'm sending you the uh, questions for discussion. So I'm just going to put it on the screen in a short while the, for the discussion, just to give you time to download the questions that I have just uh, uploaded to the chat group. Okay, so the first discussion, uh, uh, you'll be there for about uh, 12 minutes. Uh, first question is five skills learning deciding discerning reflecting and sacralizing these are the uh, level three thinking skills uh, learning deciding discerning reflecting and sacralizing these executive functions are potentials in your brain in your frontal cortex which of these intrigue you the most so that you'd like to explore that thinking, power or skill this or next week? And why is that? So that's the first question that you will be sharing with the people in your group. Now, the second question is, while all of the thinking skills promote learning, the executive learnings relate ultimately to what you learn about you, about time, about others, about intention, about meanings, and so on. These become the learnings in your matrix of frames. This explains why smart and intelligent people can be very dumb when it comes to these more intimate and personal learnings. For those of you who've been watching YouTube, then you can relate to uh, young Sheldon. Uh, that's why they can be intelligent, but dumb about themselves, relationships, values, and so on. Now, the question is, what does this realization trigger in you? Okay, so those are the uh, questions. And in a short while, I'm going to uh, invite you into the uh, where is breakout rooms. Okay, into the breakout rooms, and let us have about three to four people in each breakout room in order to uh, in order to uh, give each person uh, more time in order to share the thoughts that you have. So. Uh, the breakout rooms are assigned automatically. Uh, have fun, and I will see you in 12 minutes. And everyone is back in the room. Yay! Welcome back, uh, everyone. And uh, I'd just like to get from you one or two responses or reactions uh, based upon what you discussed uh, Anyone uh, has anything to share with the main room here? Go ahead. What was the big aha that you had in your discussion? <laughs> so, Marjuki. Yes. I like the sec. I will speak something about the second questions. I like the second questions about smart intelligence, but dumb to ourselves. <laughs> I like that questions. <laughs> we are we are discussing. We were discussing it in our group, but suddenly the time's up. So well, interesting. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mariani. Uh, anyone else? Well, about that question, uh, it really is the human dilemma. 
you know, we send people to school and college, universities, and they learn so much, but they can come out and not be intelligent about themselves, which is why emotional intelligence and other things have developed in recent years. A lot of leaders, real intelligent about the the technical stuff, but in terms of relating to people and themselves, um, missing the boat. Thank so, you, Michael, Michael. Yeah. that comes that Michael. So, can I ask relate to the questions? So, relate to what you say that somebody, someone can be smart, intelligent in the technical skills, but they are dumb in the relating emotional things. Can it will can it be vice versa? Means that it can be smart in relation, but dumb in the technical skill. For sure, for sure. There's people who loving, gracious, wonderful people who can't make a living. Wow, well, that's true. So sure. Thank you. Okay. I would like to add some masuki if I can. I yes, just go didn't ahead. raise my hand. So I just had a reflection. I've been working as a top leader for very many years, and um, I can see that this is to the point on being a manager where you focus on growing the business, you're growing the organization, you're always facing outwards, outwards on anything else but yourself, and trying to make that develop in, and grow and be prosperous and uh, function in a very good way. And you are so busy doing that. So you never have the time to reflect. You never have the time to be truly reflexive. Yeah. And for for myself, after doing my coaching education and choosing this path instead, that's a totally new world. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about the synergy between us adding that to the world of be all those experts that are just moving on um, that's a, that's a beautiful thought in itself. So, uh, and that adds to the work that I'm doing with leaders and managers uh, to to frame it in a different way. So I really appreciate this question. Um, and then I had another point that I forgot. <laughs> that's life. <laughs> yeah. Well, Thank you. you're so that you remember. You're so you're so right about we get so results oriented we forget about the process and that's where the ecology question helps us to rebalance things yeah my point being thank you michael was that i'm a little bit worried about the speed of the world and our ability to be refre reflexive uh, because because when is it that we are going to stop the train for everybody and give them a chance to reflect. It really takes a lot of uh, self-control or somebody stopping us or something happening. We're, we're so busy making a living that we forget to live. Exactly. And then you don't learn about sacralizing because that was a new word to me. So that was bullseye too. We never get to that point. Yeah. Thank you. Are you ready for the next two questions? And these are, okay, question number three is that many people never make executive decisions about themselves and their lives. They default on whatever they were told what they learned as kids, what their culture tells them. Consequently, they have not gone meta to become their own inner executive with the power of self-control, self-discipline, self-determination, and so on. How well does this make sense to you? What questions does this evoke in you? So that's question number three. And question number four, we all think and live instrumentally, setting goals, wanting to achieve certain objectives. It is our deficiency, thinking and feeling. 
So how strange and weird does it feel to learn about non-instrumental thinking and living? How would you define being cognition if someone asked you? How well? So those are the questions that you'll be discussing in your uh, breakout rooms in a short while. So I will be assigning the breakout rooms, reducing the number of rooms in order to have a little bit more people in each room. Right. And uh, have fun in the next 12 minutes. Uh, discuss those two questions and I'll see you in 12 minutes time. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, let's uh, open up the uh, the room. Uh, let me hear what were the bright moments or aha moments that you had in that uh, discussion just now. So go ahead, unmute yourself if you want to share something to the main room. Go ahead. I have an aha moment. This is Gada. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Michael mentioned something very important. For those who think this exist uh, existential question, who am I? Many people are stuck there thinking who am I and thinking over and over. Uh, according to him, it's rather to think what am I doing or how am I functioning this or that? which is an excellent answer uh, that makes you move forward to your goals rather than staying there and thinking only. Thank you very much, Dr. Mike. Thank you, uh, Gada. Anyone else? Uh, Michael, there's a question from the, the Chinese group. Um, it's, um, okay, I, I have to tell them I'll just wait for me. <laughs> uh, the, the question from the Chinese group is that um, the one of them said that uh, they have she has been doing making all the decisions since she was very young, but then uh, thinking about about that that when she makes the decision she based on what she experiences she based on the culture she based on those families uh, information those decisions that she make is that her own decision or is still being affected by this by the family? Do you understand this questions? Because, yeah, because we talk about uh, having our own power, making decisions or making things for ourselves. But then in addition, we are also in this environment, we are in this culture, we are with all these family members, more or less, we are also being influenced by that. So how to describe this now? So, so that's what fell under the category of discernment. In discernment, you got this context and this one and this one and this one. You got your business, you got your family, you got your health, you got your um, goals, many contexts, and you're trying to make a decision. And discernment is figuring out which one of these contexts is most prominent right now, most important right now. And so in discernment, the, the answer, the wise choice will keep shifting. It depends upon when you ask that question and uh, what are the values that um, are going back and forth. Thank you, Michael. Uh, anyone else has got any uh, insights? I don't know if I can be heard. Can I be heard, Ma Mazuki? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I was in the group and Michael Hall and Geraldine was in the same group with Gada. And the second, the fourth question about, you know, living non-instrumentally. And I was just sharing that for, I've been meditating for 15 years and I start with the question, who am I? And that's the difficult question to deal with because there's no answer. And Michael just did a simple change and says, how am I being now? <laughs> and that opened up a tremendous amount of, you know, awareness. How am I, you know, thinking? How am I feeling? It's just so much more uh, fathomable as opposed to who am I? 
So that's a big one, big one for me. And, you know, uh, from tomorrow morning, I'm going to start with how am I? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Yes. Uh, anyone else has got one thing that you would like to share? Maybe, uh, yes, Tanner here once again. Uh, maybe a question about um, also connecting to this, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead. Is it so? Um, how can we train people not to think? Sorry, can you... and, and what do you mean by not thinking? <laughs> well, yeah, so, so the, the, the more. The, the not the being how do, how do we train them to to um, reduce or stop their sort of cognitive process and connect for example with yeah. what you just said uh, yeah yeah so it's not a contrast between thinking and not thinking it's between instrumental thinking and being thinking cognitive um, being being cognition so being cognition is um, how am I being? And that goes to now thinking about qualities of life. Am I being loving? Am I being compassionate? Am I, am I being scared? Am I being irrational? So how am I being? Is cognitive um, thinking or being cognition. And so it's not, you, you cannot not think. <laughs> if you think you can't think, you're thinking about not thinking. <laughs> So you will inevitably think it's just the quality of the thinking, the nature of the thinking, the the the, the ecology of that question of thinking. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Michael. And uh, looking at the time, we've been uh, here for more than two hours already. So, Michael, may I invite you to give a, a few words to summarize, to wrap things up before we end the session. Go ahead, Michael. Well, we all think. We just don't all think equally well. And what we do in NLP and neurosemantics is help ourselves and others to be more clear in our thinking, more precise, more accurate, more kind, more loving in our thinking more able to think in such a way that is going to make our lives and the lives of other people better. You have, just like I have, some prefrontal cortexes that enables us to be the executive of our life. And that's what we want for ourselves and for each other. We want people to take ownership of their life and to identify their values, their beliefs, and to live with integrity and honesty and authenticity with their values. And so what we do as coaches, as trainers, as, as parents, as therapists, what we do is to raise the quality of thinking on this planet. That's our big goal in neurosemantics. And so I wanna thank you for being a part of this and what we've done today. It's really just the beginning. We've got so much work to do for ourselves and for other people, and raising the quality of thinking. If we raise the quality of thinking, we raise the quality of our lives. And that's what we want. Thank you, Michael. It strike, it struck a deep chord uh, in me, and I hope that it does the same for all of you. And I would like to say thank you to all of you for being here uh, this evening, morning, or afternoon. However, before we end, I would just like to take some photos as memento of our being here this evening. So get ready, uh, get your face all ready for the photo session and all that. Uh, yeah, uh, switch on your video. Mosi Dishi, I love your smile uh, there. Thank you, everyone. Let's take a first photo. Ready? Three, two, one. Excellent. And uh, the second page over here. Wow, I'm seeing lots of lots of beautiful, beautiful smiles. Ready? Three, two, one. Wonderful. We've got those pictures. And uh, just to 
Uh, again, thank you for your presence and participation uh, in this meeting. Our next meeting will be on the 9th of December. So look forward to seeing all of you and also let the people around you know uh, that we'll be meeting on the 9th of December. And hopefully on the 9th of December, we'll be meeting at the Times published. <laughs> Again, for those of you who came on time this evening, uh, 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 my apologies that we started uh, uh, early before you. However, the next meeting, let's keep to the time <laughs> that we that, uh, publish. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, end by wishing all of you an exceptional quality of life filled with mm -hmm. happiness, creativity, and fulfillment. Thank you very much, everyone. See you there. Thank See you the next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Well. Thank you, Marjuki. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Bye, thank, you. thank you so bye. much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Marjuki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.